Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our beekeeping program. Tonight's speaker is Tate Belden, and he has some very interesting methods in dealing with swarms. And swarm season is not that far away. So rather have everyone thinking about it, being a little prepared, have some tools in the, in the beekeeping toolbox. And Tate has also been a speaker at the Wyoming Bee College Conference. And he was going to be a speaker at the 2020 Bee College this year. But uh, anyway, so we get to enjoy him on Zoom. So Tate, tell, tell us how long you've been a beekeeper. Hey, Catherine, good evening, everybody. I started way back in high school when I needed an FFA project. But being a city kid, I wasn't allowed to have livestock in town uh, in the city limits. And it was suggested that I look at honeybees. And so, yes, I may be the reason why for a while at least keeping bees within the limits of Laramie was illegal for a bit. But I did have one hive there in the yard. I got hooked up with a fellow that worked with the bee lab there in Laramie, at the University of Wyoming. And uh, he had a small commercial outfit in northern Colorado. So I was able to run around for about three years and see things from the small scale commercial side of life and that has tainted my perspective on many things ever since very good and then it was about five years ago that after our son left for college uh, heather and i decided we wanted to do something together and uh, i suggested honeybees and i was very pleasantly surprised when she jumped at the opportunity and she's done very well ever since excellent well tate i'm going to turn the program <clears throat> over to you and uh, back to you, I think, real quick, or do I, should I just go ahead and take off? Just go ahead and take off and, and teach us what we need to know about. Uh, well, in that case, let's go ahead and run with this. Go for <laughs> Are it. There, Are you there? Yep. All righty. Let's talk swarms, swarming. Let's go through this a little bit. I hope you all can see the slides okay. Uh, do raise a hand or hit the chat. Catherine's kind of keeping an eye on that, and we'll see if we have any questions come up. But let's look at so what is a swarm. A swarm is the reproductive process of the superorganism that we call a honeybee colony. Um, how you choose to respond to swarms is going to depend partly on where you live, what is your environment, and also um, your own management style. If you're one of those that's trying to make nukes and packages for somebody, losing bees is probably not conducive to your end goals. One of the nice things about a swarm is you have a hive that wants to swarm, that's a good sign. That means that they're healthy, they're doing well, the population is growing, and they have plenty of forage and life is good. And this is something that a lot of people struggle with is the idea that you cannot stop swarming. This is the, it's just kind of like having kids in high school uh, running around with the cars. Things are going to happen. This is a reproductive drive. They're going to get together. Things are going to happen. So you need to manage this swarming instinct, this swarming drive of your colonies. Unless you happen to be in an area where you don't care and you can just let them go do their own thing and have wild feral bees all over the area, could be to your advantage. But most of us that live in an urban environment that we keep our bees within a city limits, we have neighbors and other property to think of, we need to be responsible and manage the swarming tendencies of our hives. No, you can't stop swarming, but that urge, that drive can be redirected in something you can utilize to your own goals. Uh, urban beekeeping isn't country beekeeping. I've alluded to that. We cannot really allow our swarms to be free in town. You're going to create problems, uh, maybe even to the point of making the keeping of bees within the city limits illegal. This becomes very expensive for other people that aren't beekeepers and I haven't heard of a case yet, but if it can be tracked back to you and say that, well, yeah, it was your bees, I don't know how you're gonna do that. But it may be that somebody can hold, try to hold you liable for expenses and repairs if they had to have a cutout. Um, at the least, defending yourself from such a claim could be a bother and a hassle you just don't need to worry about. And it doesn't create the goodwill that we wanna have. We wanna be uh, participating members in our community. We want people to be enthusiastic and supportive of our efforts and maybe even get into it themselves. They see the problem side of it, they're not gonna be very warm to us. So how do you know a colony is going to swarm? Well, you look for the signs, the impending cast of a swarm. First off, you're gonna have an abundance of drones. Maybe not necessarily in that specific hive or in that specific colony that wants to, to swarm, 
but because this is a reproductive process, there need to be drones available around someplace. And if you have other colonies that are throwing a lot of drones, you're helping support that process. Queen cells, and I'm not talking about queen cups, but actual cells with larvae that are developing. The more cells you see, the more likely you are to be having uh, at the least a supersedure, but it's probable that you're gonna have a swarm. There are those that like to look at where are those cups on the frame. If they're more towards the middle or the top of the frame, that maybe isn't so indicative of a swarm. Along the bottom edge of a frame is where you find those, those queen cups. That may be in, uh, indicating a stronger uh, impulse to swarm. They need to have a high population. They're gonna divide this colony at least in half or maybe even two thirds, one third. So you have to have enough of a population left to carry on with the parent colony. Plenty of brood. You need to be in the middle of a honey flow. You need to have adequate resources. If you're in a dearth and things are dry, they're probably not gonna to wanna to swarm out. And you do need to see it at the right time of the year. Uh, there's an old adage, I see if I can rem remember it. Uh, a swarm in May is worth a bale of hay, a swarm in June is worth a silver spoon, a swarm in July ain't worth a fly. And that has to do with how much of the season is left for that daughter colony to actually get established and to recover. They're taking a big risk, they're taking a big chance of splitting off from uh, known resources, uh, known hive that they know that they're safe in, to start over from scratch and to build everything up from the ground. So they're gonna need a lot of honey to build the wax. They're gonna need a lot more to build stores for the winter and they've gotta have the room to get the brood going too. So when they leave, they don't know that they're gonna find a new home. In the bee yard, a traditional method of handling swarms, and one that I even remember hearing about way back when, was to kill off the cells. Queen off, kill off those queen cells. No virgin queens, no young queens, you're not gonna throw, throw swarms. Yeah, to a point. Eventually they're gonna go ahead and do it anyway, whether they leave us a queen behind or not. It's not foolproof. Um, you may want to uh, increase your colony count in your yard. So a lot of people do this. They figure that if you split strong colonies into numerous smaller colonies, you're not going to have as strong a tendency to swarm. Some of these techniques for splitting require you to find the queen. And if you're good at that, rock on. This is more like what the commercial side is going to do or somebody that's into production. You can do a blind split where you don't care if you find the queen or not. You just split the hive and you know she's in one or the other. You give the other one some resources. Depending on how the population is split, where you place the daughter colony if it's in the same yard, you, you may just delay that swarm impulse. Um, if you do a blind split, you kind of have to move that daughter colony far enough away to where that those foragers will reorient to the new colony. Otherwise, they're just going to leave that and go back to the parent colony and you're going to lose the daughter colony as it is. What I'm talking about here, uh, what we want to talk about with the Taranoff split does not lend itself to a fast application. This process takes time. Um, it's not something you're gonna see in a production yard. Um, so what, what, getting back to it, yeah, the splits is doing a blind split does lend itself to a fast application. You can get into a yard of, of 50 colonies, knock them down into 100 colonies, take the other 50 off with you someplace and away you go. Uh, in a larger outfit, if we had uh, folks from Bryant, I'm sure they'd be able to talk about all the splits that they're making all the time. One of the things that you can get from a split is it may not have the ideal roles in the bees. As we all know, as a honeybee progresses and ages, they're going to go through different roles in the colony, starting as a nurse bee, then as a builder, uh, ultimately ending up as a forager um, out at, at the end of their lives. So you may end up with uh, no foragers or a bunch of foragers. Fortunately, they're plastic enough, flexible enough. They'll fill in the gaps where they need to, but you may not be getting optimal mix. You may not be getting optimal performance out of them. And so here it is. I am an urban hobbyist. I want to enjoy my colonies, not work them. This isn't a job. This is supposed to be fun. I want to kick back and sit in the yard, have a nice sparkly drink and watch the bees fly and know that all is good and well in the world. This process, a Terranov swarm, is going to get you involved in your colony, and it's good to see them in action. It's nice to be involved. Be proactive in their care and in your management rather than reactive. This, one of the goals that we have is you must maintain, as much as we can control anything in beekeeping, you must maintain control of both the parent and the daughter colony. You don't want to create a situation where one of them is suddenly just up and absconds and you've lost half of one of your hives. 
also in an urban environment, we can only increase the yard so far. I've got one yard, I have regulatory limits. We have two hobbyist beekeepers, so at the most, I can have 10 hives in the yard. I have no interest in making nukes and selling them off. Uh, that's just not my arena, that's not what I wanna do. And because of where I live, I cannot allow open free swarming because of the damage and the liability issues and the neighbor relations and all that. And there are limited resources on hand. Whatever boxes I happen to have out in the trailer out back, that's what I've got to work with. No more, no less, unless I spend more money. And that's not my goal. So a couple of base concepts. For this system to work, we need to understand that worker roles are age dependent. Younger bees haven't yet learned to fly. That's a good one to remember. The older bees, the ones that are more tend to be the foragers, they have oriented to the colony location and they do fly. Because we're going to be interrupting a queen while she's laying, we know that she is all distended and in a laying prime. She's got a lot of brood going. She doesn't want to uh, fly if she can help it. We're going to do this before that they have started uh, starving back the queen and causing the atrophy to where she, old queen will want to fly in a swarm. I'm trying to do this just a little bit earlier. We also know, uh, especially if you've read uh, Dr. Seeley's works, that swarms are made up of a mix, leaning towards more of a younger bee population. They take some of the younger bees with them rather than all the older ones. And we need those younger bees because those are the ones that make the wax. So if you're starting a daughter colony out in a split and you don't have drawn comb, or if you happen to be a swarm that's going to go out and set up a hive in a new location, you need those young bees with their functioning wax glands to make the structure for everybody else to live in. So this is just another tool in your chest. This is not an absolute, not everybody has to do it, but it works for the goals and the reasons that I've said. We tried to mimic as much as possible the natural swarming process while maintaining a control of both colonies so we don't lose the bees, but we hope to satisfy that urge. We can get, like, get them some pieces. This It does take time to do this, so about two hours per colony is roughly what I see happening with this. So it doesn't scale. If you've got 100 colonies out there you need to take care of, this might not be the method you want to use, but it's easy. Simple requirements. Anybody can do it, and it gets you involved in your hive. Uh, gets you involved with your colony. You can see what they're doing. You need a board. This is a picture of the Terranov board, and I happen to have that same one right here. So you can see it's a little bit of a larger object. Um, can't even show the whole thing on camera, it looks like, but you can. I have dimensions for it. The dimensions and size of this thing are not critical. There are very few aspects of this whole thing that are critical. So I hope to highlight those for you. You need the top end of your ramp to be able to reach where the entrance of your hive is. So if you have like mine, they're up on yard stands and they're about 18 inches off the ground. My ramp is 18 inches tall. If you happen to have them just set on a pallet and you're only about eight inches off the ground, you can try that. Maybe eight inches is enough. When you see what we're doing, you may want to elevate that hive a little bit more just to help with the sorting process. Um, I like the ramp to be at least at a 30 degree angle. A little steeper is better than shallower. Um, you don't have to be critical on these dimensions. Again, this is just to fit your equipment, to fit your hive. One of the things that is nice is to have that swarm bar and those side wings. And when you see how the bees will move up this thing, you'll see where that comes into play. This helps to create a swarming pocket or a place for them to cluster. You're gonna have the queen and most of the younger bees are hanging off the bottom of this thing at some point. So it's kind of nice to give them a place to hang out while you're waiting for everything to finish up. And again, the dimensions, These are this is what mine is. I literally just found a piece of OSB in the garage and I don't think it's even square. I just kind of start putting it together and this is what I ended up with. Um, it fits my equipment, it fits my yard. You're gonna to wanna to make yours to fit your equipment, fit your yard. The thing that's gonna be important is to have that pocket at the bottom on the underside, about four inches from the end, so you have a place for the cluster to form up on and hang out and be content. When you put it together, this is the basic layout. You're gonna to wanna to keep a gap between the end of your Terranov board and your entrance, and because I use these nice little hive stands, those wonderful little garden creations, I have to include that as my entrance. The idea is you wanna create a space to where a bee cannot walk into the hive, they have to fly. So we might even wanna extend that a little bit further. And there's a little more to it than this. 
the gap to the parent hive or the landing board needs to be at least four inches. A little more is even better. Again, the angle, if it's a little steeper, it's better than being too shallow. You want to have space on the end of that board hanging below it, kind of nice to have it up off the ground, for that cluster to form on the end of the board and not get down into the grass or become a problem. The details, again, aren't critical. You want to make it to fit your own equipment, your own yard. And the idea here is once you learn the bee's behavior, shape things, size things, do things to where you're using their behavior to achieve your goals. Basic process. Set up the board, and this is the one thing you'll see later on. We then drape that board with a large sheet. I use an old bed sheet. We're going to pull all the frames from the hive, and we're going to shake or brush all of the bees off those frames onto the sheet near the bottom end of the ramp. And if you shake it, uh, you want to make sure that you're not shaking any frames that have queen cells. Shaking those queen cells will likely kill them. Also, if you're in the middle of the flow, you're going to have a lot of nectar in those frames. You start shaking them, you're going to end up with a wet, sticky sheet. It may be best just to brush them off. Again, once they're up, you're going to hold this up above the ground. You're going to sweep those off, shake them off. They're going to hit the sheet if they're not flying. The queen isn't flying. The younger bees don't fly. They land on that sheet and they follow their normal behavior. They walk uphill. The ones that fly, your older bees, are going to do just that. They're free and loose in the air, they're oriented to the hive, they fly back to the entrance, they skip the board and the sheet all together, and they just fly right back into the, the colony to take care of business. Um, at the end of all this, you'll end up with a swarm cluster, including the old queen and a majority of the younger young bees hanging off the end of this board. This is what it looks like before you start. So we've got the sheet there, I've got other hives in the yard, I don't worry about them. Um, I'm going to take that three deep uh, hive apart, pull all the frames out, and then put the frames back in the right order, in the right place for, for where it started from. So those bees that are flying back are come back into a familiar colony, come into a familiar hive, they know, they know what's going on there. Just another view. This is again what's called the traditional method. There is a modification that kind of helps a little bit. Um, but this is the traditional method of doing this. And that gap there is probably closer to five or six inches, and that's just okay. Minimum of four inches, longer isn't bad. This is the common variation. Take the hive body with the drawn comb and the frames ready for your daughter colony, put that under the end of that board. That extends that gap out quite a bit. That's closer to 10 inches here. But it gives those bees then when they cluster up on the end of that board, they will go right down into those frames and they they're feel that they're at home and they're taking care of business. You may even have the queen just walk right down in there with the rest of them as well. So this is what it looks like. This is my lovely lady Heather is watching them. And like I said, it's a good opportunity to get down in the bees and get up close and personal with them. One thing to notice here is if you look to the little two box hive on the right, there do appear to be a few uh, bees that have drifted over. And this is another thing to watch. It's kind of entertaining to see that. We've always been told that the bee trying to enter the wrong hive will be attacked and defended. And if you watch them, they're much gentler about it. They just kind of push her back out and say, uh, you know, you're in the wrong place. And they'll pay attention and respond and fly off. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of aggression unless that, that improper port of that interloper is trying to force her way in. And when those guard bees are there just saying, you know, nudging and pushing back, it doesn't seem to be aggressive at all. There'll be some that'll go over there. Most of them will come back to the parent hive anyway. It's not a big deal. The flyers will fly. They go back to the parent colony. Those that don't fly, the young bees and the queen, they cluster up on the end of the board. And this is one of the traditional viewpoints right here. And it's kind of neat to get down in there and look at that daughter cluster. Just you can see how far they go. And yes, even with 18 inches, you will end up with some bees in the grass. Be careful you don't lose your queen down there. You can get some quite large clusters. They will build up quite a bit. Towards the end of this whole process, I do tend to take the sheet and shake the bees off the sheet and onto the board itself when there are a few of them. Get the sheet out of the way so you can work with things. Make sure you pick up those little clusters. You don't want to lose your queen in the grass. Uh, but as we talked about, the one variation, put the new hive under the end of the board. You don't have to worry about the queen falling off into the grass. Uh, the cluster will pretty much all move into the new hive right away. It does save you a little bit of time. And it's easier to move. When you pick up that board with that heavy cluster on the end of it, 
you take a sudden step or you trip or something goes wrong, you can give them a shock and they'll all fall off and you're kind of in a mess at that point. If you get them going right into the box, they're in a box, you hold it together, it's a lot easier to move you can take care of it. You do have some bees left on the board, no big deal. Just hold it over the end of your, your new daughter box and just shake them off and they'll go right there. If you're setting them up on new frames, bare foundation, for example, or if they're having to draw wax for any other reason, you're going to want to feed them. Uh, if they have enough of a honey flow on, they probably will ignore your feed and go right to the natural forage. But just in case, you want to give them every advantage you can. Give them the feed. Make it available to them. Let them make the choice. So this is the setup that I use. This is the way I like to do it. My box is hanging on frames. I put that board there. That four, that four inches back where that uh, swarm bar is, is right above the edge wall of the box of that hive body. Shake them out. Let them walk and crawl or fly as they choose. You can see we have some drifting here on the left for number 10. Those bees will just get nudged back out into the flying zone and they'll go out and they'll find their way home in a moment. You can see that the cluster on the sheet is getting fewer and fewer and smaller. They're moving in. There's a little drift, no big deal. You just gotta give it time. This does take some time. It's about two hours to do all this, depending on the size of the colony and the conditions. Don't get in a hurry. You just get in there and start trying to move things around to stir them up and uh, you can create issues for yourself. It's getting smaller. Right about here is about when I pull those sides of that sheet up to make a V and funnel all those bees back onto the board itself. And there they are. From here, I can pick up the tail end of that board, drop that cluster into that new box, pick up the box and set it in the yard and away we go. There's the parent hive, all happy. And what they have in there is they have all that brood, those fresh eggs, the more mature bees to take care of things and do, do what they need to do. There will be some younger bees, so they will have nurses, but all of those newly emerging bees will become nurses right away as well. So that colony right there is in happy standing, ready to go. The only thing they don't have is a queen, but they have eggs. So they're gonna make a queen for you right, right away. This is the daughter colony inside there. You've got a laying queen. I have drawn comb when I do mine. You've got a lot of the near, young bees to help take care of the brood and get the, the comb ready for the queen to lay in as well as take care of that young brood and feed them. They're ready to rock and roll. The one thing I will caution you about is make sure you allow enough space. This particular one, I had to uh, put a second box on it a few, <laughs> about an hour later. It was just too, too crowded in there. No concern about the location. Those younger bees that you have put in the daughter colony, you can put that daughter colony right next to your parent hive and they won't drift across. They have not oriented yet. They haven't learned to fly out. So you're not worried about losing your split into back into the parent colony. They are mostly the inner bees. They're ready to go. It'll take them about a day or two to, to get oriented. Some of those older younger bees will take over as foragers and move on, but they will get their orientation to the new location. They won't even try to go back to the old one. And like I talked about, this is a, a nice problem. It's about two hours after that picture, I had to put a second box on there, a second D, because they were chock-a-block, wall-to-wall, packed in there, so like, you could hardly move around. So it, was, it was, was creating another problem. But a month later, checked them out again, make sure everything was good. Everybody was going ga gangbusters. I had eggs in both colonies. I had brood being produced. I had honey being made and stored and put away. Nice, quick, fast, easy to do, and I have prevented that parent colony, that wonderful, strong parent colony from swarming. So where do they go now? What are they going to be in? Parent hive, the existing brood will emerge. They've got plenty of young workers. They're back where they need to be. They have eggs to make a new queen. They're ready to go. The foragers will continue. There may not be quite as many of them, but they still have plenty of them. They'll keep that energy, that nectar coming in. Just don't want to inspect too soon. Give them a chance to recover and do things. I'd say at least a week before you start digging through that parent colony, maybe even longer. Now, this is one of the nice side benefits in this Varroa mite that we're all fighting so hard. By doing this, you're going to create a natural brood break in the parent colony. The eggs that are in there right now are going to keep going, but they're going to have a queenless phase where they don't have new eggs uh, being laid they're going to end up with a brood break. It's going to come a little bit later, but they're going to have a, a time with no new brood. In the daughter colony, you have the same thing. 
queen's going to maybe start laying right away that day. So you're going to have at least seven days or so before you have sealed brood again. So you've got a bit of a break. If you want to treat, this is a good time to treat on that daughter colony. There's no sealed brood and OEV treatment is going to get in there. Give them one shot of that and you know you've taken care of whatever may have come across. And the parent colony, you want to let a majority of that sealed brood emerge. You've still got that dead time where you don't have that queen laying yet. So you're going to have a break where you can get in there, give them a treat, maybe 14 days after you've done all this so that you can get the, the mites knocked down that parent colony as well. And we've already gone over this part. Daughter colony, the queen is ready to lay now. If comb is available, the older young bees will begin their orientation flights. Foraging will resume maybe even that same day or the next day. The natural brood break happens and you have managed to initiate a swarming behavior without losing track of the bees and without having a swarm get away from you. Let them do what they want to do. We have let them fly if they want to fly. We let them crawl if they want to crawl. They're in a new place. The old queen has gone to a new location. Kind of tricks them to thinking that everything's happened the way they expect it to happen. You've also divided your parent colony along worker roles. You haven't taken all the old foragers out of the parent colony. You've taken mostly the young nurse bees, the younger bees there. But it's not a perfect mix. They, they, they don't read the same books and they want to do what they want to do. So you're going to have some of those older foragers will just get lazy and walk up the ramp and who knows, some of those younger bees may want to go ahead and try flying. They can smell the parent colony, so they'll go for it. But there's enough of this separation that you'll get the results that you want. For me, the number one thing is you don't have to find the queen. If you want to do blind splits, you don't have to find the queen either. But with this method, I know where she's at just because of the behavior of the, of the bees. Both colonies will have an appropriate mix for what they're doing, for what's going on. A parent colony will requeen itself. and You have not lost control. So there it is. You make control of your bees, you've done a split, you've prevented swarming, and you've got a chance to enjoy and to watch what is going on. And uh, this is a chime now then. <laughs> There's the contact information if you have any questions. I'll make these slides available on our website as well. I'm trying to record this presentation. If nothing else, I can go back and see what I did and didn't do well for you all. But I kind of like, uh, Catherine, if we could, Let's open up the floor for questions. If anybody has anything they want to ask about or comments to make or suggestions, ideas, this is where we all get better at this. Kate, I've got one question here. Um, it's when should one start this during a nice day? So, you know, you've got a, a hive that you think is going to get ready to swarm. Is there a, a better time during the day to start this than another? That's a good question. And I'm not sure that a a really great answer for that. You need to take into account the timing. Uh, you're looking at about two hours, so I want to make sure that the temperatures stay up. I don't have wind or rain coming in. Uh, and remember, you have a lot of your process are going to come back in later. So I'm going to say probably no later than two in the afternoon, maybe three in the afternoon, depending on what the, the spring thunder showers do for you. Um, maybe even early in the morning. So I'm going to just ballpark it and say sometime between 10 and 2 would be a good safe place to do that. You know your area, you know your bees. Hey Tate, I got another question here. It's do you feel if you shake the bees off the frame it will mess with eggs one to four days old? Probably. So that's why I like to brush when I'm in those brood spaces. And I know that I've got that queen in there. I may have queen cells on those same frames. Yeah, I'll be brushing those off. I'll be doing the shake more on the sealed honey areas or on the open empty frames. It's a lot faster to shake than it is to brush, but you're right. Take care of where you're going to be doing that. You don't want to hurt your, your youngins. Good, good catch. So another question. So you are not taking any frames from the parent hive into the daughter colony? Nope, none at all. I have just happened to be in the fortunate position that I have enough drawn comb that I can make up all those daughter hives with drawn frames. And that's all they need. That makes it way easy for them. If you don't have the drawn frames, you're going straight onto foundation. You might want to feed them a little bit more. But again, I would not give them any frames out of the parent colony. I just go ahead and give them all new. They're a swarm. Remember, you treat them like a swarm. They're moving into a whole new place. So that, that's kind of my rationale on that idea. So are you using any 
lures or any any um, essential oils or anything to help this process along? Nope, none at all. Um, the only time I use any kind of an essential oil is when I'm uh, baiting swarm traps, which is another good idea, another good thing to have out around your yard just in case you miss one of these things going off. You put traps out and around, you might be lucky enough to catch your own swarms. And I'll use it just a very, very small amount of the lemongrass oil as an attractant at the uh, hive entrance. The idea is that I'll, I'll take a, like a cotton, a Q-tip, one drop of oil on that, of that lemongrass oil, and I'll just touch the, around the entrance of my swarm trap with that. And that's just to give them a draw. Come look at this. Come see what we have here. Inside my swarm trap, I'm going to have the gankiest, old, yanky, dark, nasty brood comb I can find in my shed. And that's what's going to attract them in. They're going to see that brood comb and say, oop, this is a well-established place. There's been a colony here before. We like this. The scouts will go in and do their sizing. So your swarm trap has to be the appropriate size. They're going to find that comb ready to go. Pretty much see it as a furnished apartment with no charge. So you got drawn comb in there, and they're going to move in right away. Um, I have seen people using lemongrass oil as a swarm bait, and they get a little excited with it. They'll put like five drops on a cotton ball, throw it in a baggie, throw that in the back of the hive. And then even me, if I'm standing downwind of that trap, I can smell that lemongrass oil. If I can smell it as too strong, you're going to run them out. They won't, they won't want to move into there. So it's, it's be very, very sparing with that. Okay, good to know. And do you ever introduce a mated queen into the parent hive to save time on rearing them on, your, on their own? That will get you back into production a lot faster than yes, you can do that. You know, after you do this Terranov split, you're going to want to let them become queenless on their own. They'll give them about 24 hours to get settled down to know that they're queenless. They may start making a queen at that point. But if you can introduce a queen in a cage and do an introduction on that parent colony 24 hours after doing the split, they'll take to her a lot more readily and you will be back in production within days instead of having to wait the 30 or so days for a queen to mature, emerge, go out, mate, come back and start laying. Um, and in fact, that's kind of a dirty little secret. We've tried for years to make our own wild queens here in our yard. And we've discovered that we just have way too many birds for that to be successful. I've had maybe one natural queen come back on her own. Typically, they go out on the mating flights and they never make it back home. So, yes, if you can get a mated queen, it puts you that much further ahead of the game. Yeah, you do have a lot of trees in your backyard and around your area. I'm sure that um, feeding a mated queen. This is queen kind of weird, Catherine. Bird, I'm And Tate, what what time frame? Are oh, and, we and since at? we start keeping the bees here, yeah, go ahead. So, is there during during that swarms? I'm sorry, you dropped out, Catherine. Yeah, what do you consider to be swarm season? Can you describe what that looks like? I think of it as kind of mid to late May to uh, the first week of July. That's also when we tend to get most of our phone calls for the swarm calls. And after you split your colonies, when do you plan to harvest honey off of them? That's on a colony by colony basis. If they are go-getters and we have the flow and they have what I consider to be the minimum 80 pounds of stores to overwinter with, whatever's extra, I'll take it. Or if I'm not sure, I may just leave it and then I'll harvest in the spring. Um, this idea of doing a fall harvest is something that has happened within the beekeeping community because that's when most of the commercial guys have to fulfill their contracts. As a hobbyist, as an urban beekeeper, I don't have a contract, so I can harvest anytime I want to. May as well do it in the spring when I know that they've got everything they need and I haven't starved out a colony. Okay, and this is, I have an apiary with three colonies. They are strong and I need to split or fear they, they will swarm? Do I set up three sets of new homes, one for each colony? Okay. Question mark. Uh, 
I would I would do three splits probably on different days or do one in the morning and one in the afternoon uh, to do two of them and then the third one on the next day. Um, but yeah, I would set up three daughter colonies, split that parent, whichever one of them you want into that daughter, you're done. And when you're finished, you've got six colonies going. Does that answer that question adequately? I wanna make sure that that hits what you're asking there. Um, she said, yes, thank you. And then um, what kind of birds disrupt new queens? What do we look for? I... <laughs> Most any of you are insectivores, uh, your blue jays, your robins, things like that. And we have got them in spades. We also have a few woodpeckers around. <laughs> Did I jump on that too fast for you? <laughs> I no, that's a... had more to that question. That's all right. I, a hungry bird is going to take advantage of what's out there. <laughs> Yes, and, and that's yes, always they are. Yep, that's always my fear too, because we've got swallows, barn swallows out here, and they are eating machines. So yeah, I just realized I was sharing my desktop and I tried to show you all the Terranov board. <laughs> you probably didn't see it. <laughs> you saw the pictures, but this is the same one, and as you can see, it's uh, got a little heft to it. But uh, here's that swarm bar underneath, about four inches from the end, and then the side wings. And those just happen to make a handy place for me to put my fold-out legs. And I just put the string on there so that I wouldn't collapse it on the ground. But uh, simple, whip it together in an afternoon in the garage, and it does the trick. Very good. And then um, someone's got a question about the Bee College. And I, I'm looking at trying to do a partial bee college in September, although I'm still a little concerned. And most likely I will, I will definitely do a bee college in May of 2021. And that's kind of dictated to me by the LCCC because <laughs> apparently they want to take spring break off. And <laughs> so, so we'll look for it and look for a full B college in May. Well, of if we have to give me give me a call, we'll Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Well if we have to give me a call. We'll see what we might be able to find space up here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward. I'm glad to hear that. I understood that, that that might have been the last one, so I'm kind of kind of glad to hear that myself. Good news. Well, we're only at about seven o'clock. I think that uh, you wanted this to go to about 7.30. Um, do you want to round table this or open it up or do we have enough uh, chaos to handle that or? We'll definitely do. And I'm, um, you know, again, <laughs> tour. So I'm, I'm opened it up and asking for questions. And so any, anything and any question, let's, you know, try to stump the beekeeper here. And yeah, <laughs> easy to do. <laughs> yeah. So I'm figuring this out as I go along. It's so good on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there was another question about is this being recorded? And I'm recording it from my end, and I think Tate's recording it from his end. So one way or the other, and I'm I'm still working on trying to get the first um, beekeeping program that I did on and available and I've got to run it through UW first and so that takes a little bit of time so working on it and then Tate here's a question for you have the Queens done the mating flight that are coming in the packages so the package packages these are mated yeah yes if you get a, a reputable retailer should be selling you and they should state this as part of their their description of what they're selling you a three pound package is the typical size comes with a mated queen. It's important to know that. And it's on a rare occasion, they might get fooled, but they'll usually, if you've ever watched how packages are made, it's kind of a brutal process. And I don't know how many folks are available, are familiar with that. Um, but you're gonna go out into your yard and you're gonna take all of your bees that you're gonna use for packages, and you kinda of, kind of do what we do with the Terranov in that you shake all the bees out of the boxes. Or, uh, usually it's a double stack, it's a two deep, so you're gonna take the top box and you're gonna take all the bees out. 
if you happen to get the queen, who cares? You're requeening all your colonies anyway. But you take all of those bees and they get dumped into a communal container, one large big box as a pile, and they are literally just stacked on top of each other. And then you'll use that box to weigh out your three pounds, and that goes in your package. You reach over here to the other tray. You've already had your queen producer from someplace, has got the mated queens in a cage. You take that queen with a cage, put her in the package, put the lid on it, send it down the road. So the bees in the package may have come from several colonies. They're not familiar with that queen that happens to be there with them, and they've just been totally disrupted. So yeah, it's, it's kind, of a, kind, of, kind of a brutal process to watch, but that's how we get packages. Yep. So getting a- Lots a, of videos on YouTube if you really want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, getting a, a knock is a lot gentler on the bees. Getting a nuke is, and that we usually we call that a nuke for nucleus. It's a nucleus colony, which means that it is a complete healthy colony, but it's small. It's, a, it's the core of the colony. It doesn't have all of the stores. It doesn't have all the frames. So a five frame nuke is a common size. It's an established colony, and it depends on the beekeeper as to how that nuke was built. Did they do a split? Did they do a blind split? Did they just take frames and then put a maid queen and do an introduction on their own? It's up to the beekeeper that's producing those nukes as to how they're doing it. But typically, yeah, it's a little bit easier on them. And for a first-time beekeeper, a, a first-year beekeeper, um, we see about an 80% success rate with nukes and a good bit less with packages. So that's something else to take into account if you're looking at that initial investment. Okay, so another question. Splitting a hive is based off the numbers in the hive, not age of the hive. So splitting is based off the numbers. It's depending on the virulent and on the popular population. Yeah, I, I would think that's a valid thing. If you have a, a healthy queen that is producing population to beat the band, uh, you've got the population is growing. You're having to add boxes on it because the honey flow is coming in. They need the room. You don't want them honey bound so the queen loses a place to lay eggs. Population is growing. Things are going good. They're getting big. Those are good conditions to start seeing. Start looking for those queen cells. Start looking for those drones. Pay attention to the time of the year. Yeah, they're a candidate for being split because they might decide to just take off and go for you. There's nothing like having a beautiful monster colony that's doing amazingly wonderful well and you're all proud of them and you're feeling good and you're looking at that, that great harvest coming up and then you go out there maybe 12 days, 15 days later than you probably should have and they're kind of average and piddling and moping along and you realize that you've lost about a half to two thirds of them already. So kind if you, <laughs> okay, Tate, if you need to make a split to satisfy the swarm urge, but do not want more colonies, how would you handle this? That's a tricky one. I'd actually, I'd actually talk to the local bee club and say, who wants to buy a colony? Because if you do it this way, if you do it with the Terranov, you're going to have an established 10 frame deep with a colony. It's not going to be just the nuke. So you ought to be able to get good money for that if people need, need them. Um, if you don't have anybody that can buy it, uh, don't make the split. Try everything else. Knock them back. You're going to want to go in and kill those queen cells. Give them all the extra room you can. It's kind of brutal. Uh, you have to do what you can. You hey. have to evaluate for yourself also how critical is it going to be be for you to not let them swarm. If you're going to be going into queen production or you're trying to get the new silver bullet wonder bee to save the world, you do want to let them swarm. Just be aware of where you're at. And I can't suggest that you do that. That becomes a whole liability issue. But yeah, be aware of what you're doing and know what your, your goals are and where you're at. Okay. So, How's that for a definite maybe? <laughs> so when should I be putting a second box on my hive that survived the winter? Assuming you've already gone through that colony top to bottom and you cleaned it out, maybe done a reversal if they're on two boxes and you know that they are full, 
if you look at the topmost box and you see about an 80% utilization of the available frames, not that you have bees on them, but they're actually using those frames. Or they have stores going in, or they got lay eggs and brood. You get about an 80% utilization, you know that they're pushing at the seams when they're ready to go. That's when I stick another box on top. Some people will look at it and say, you lift the lid, you look at the frames, and if you've got bees on top of eight out of 10 of those frames, stick a box on top. Not a bad metric, maybe a little soon, but you'll get a feel for it too. If you've given them too much room and they're not working into the new box, you can always take it off. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. Again, anyone sure. have any beekeeping questions, feel free. Or if you even want a virtual tour of the dungeon, I can show you the 3D printer that's making face shields. I've got some RC aircraft around, a lot of computers and radio stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> we can get wonderfully distracted. <laughs> yes, uh, the, uh, the world, world's of wonder down there. And then, um, circus, so yeah. Tate, how do you treat for mites? What is your mite treatment program? Alcohol wash in the spring okay and i want to get a baseline count i'm also looking at my bottom boards to make sure that i haven't missed anything obvious i don't like drop counts because it's very difficult to get an accurate drop count um, i use an alcohol wash because i want a definitive known reproducible number that i can record and know what is my infestation rate for me my treating threshold is if i get three mites out of a half cup of bees 300 bees from a brood frame, then I know I've got a problem. Then it's time to treat, and I use oxalic acid vaporization. I'm a little bit old on that. The new tendency is to use OAV when you are broodless, so you don't have to worry about new mites coming out of that sealed brood. I get around that by doing the three OAV treatments every seven days. But the important part, and one that I apparently missed last fall, is a couple of weeks after that last treatment, you need to do another wash. That's going to put you into summer, into midsummer. You're, you're gaining on time there. You need to know that your treatments were effective and you don't have a lingering infestation. Um, if, they, if you do, you might want to consider a different method of treating uh, a thigh mall, uh, might away quick strip, something like that. I am not a fan of the organophosphate insecticides, uh, uh, carocytes, uh, but I do like some of the more of the. Uh, the natural essence, uh, the, the, what is the one, the, um, the hop, the hop guard, uh, thymol, mite away quick strips, things of that nature. Uh, but if you do that follow up mite count you, and you have a high count still, then you know that your OAV treatments weren't effective and you need to do something. Um, I will do that again in the fall um, after, uh, right about the harvest time, if I'm going to do a fall harvest, uh, end of September, I'll, I'll do an alcohol wash again to make sure that that mite population has not climbed up on me again and if it has I knock it back with that OAV and I'll be doing my last alcohol wash maybe end of October early November when things are getting downright cold and you're running out of time but that way then I know and this is what I didn't do last year but then I would know that going into winter they've got their stores I've already got my minimum weights and I know that they're going into that winter stupor essentially mite free that's how I do it. Okay. Is it perfect? No. Seems to work if I do it right. <laughs> Don't always do it right, so it doesn't always work. <laughs> so Tate, what what size measuring cup do you use to know you've got 300 bees? Are you going like a half a cup of bees or more? I have I have to look at my kit. Uh, Randy Oliver has posted all that up on his site on scientificbeekeeping.com. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head if it's a quarter cup or a half cup, but there's a, a, a measured size that you can it, it smooth it off of, of a half size cup will give you 300 bees, close enough to where you can run with it. It's, it's not going to be an absolute exact. You may have 310, you may have 290, but you're not going to have a huge variation on that. It's going to give you a good size. And um, if you happen to be in the area, I'll show you my kit. I, I do the this method where you take uh, brood frames, make sure you don't get your queen. And so you're looking for your queen on the frame 
you brush all those bees off into a Tupperware container, gives you a chance to look for those, that queen again, because they're all in the bottom of the, of the Tupperware container. And you're doing the same thing there. Your adult bees are going to fly off and your younger nurse bees, the ones that are likely to have the mites on them, are going to stay in that Tupperware container. Look at them close, make sure I don't have that queen. I do my scoop measure, blade it off with my hand so that I, I have that half cup, quarter cup, and then it goes right into the alcohol bath right away. Put the colony back together and they're all happy and then I can get my numbers. Okay. I, I've known, Tate, I've known some people to feel that they can treat their bees just by um, dusting them with powdered sugar and that the bees will just naturally groom the mites off when they groom the powdered sugar off themselves. Any comments about dusting your bees with powdered sugar for mite control? You, if you get good and practice and experience, you can get consistent counts using a sugar roll. As a control method, you're gonna have an impact on the mite population, but if you look at where those phoretic mites are living on the foragers, they're up inside the plates underneath. And they get in between those abdominal plates on uh, usually on the back so they can puncture through that membrane there and eat into the fat body. So this is what they're after, the fat bodies. So if you look at that mite when she is nested in there and attached she's any place to where a bee would groom or you can get sugar on her so i don't see that as being an effective control method you may be able to do consistently if you wanted to do sugar shake uh, sugar uh counts like that sugar shakes um all every weekend you may be able to keep the population down but as an ad, uh, an acute control method i don't see it as being effective Okay, because I, I have certainly seen people trying to do that, and I think there's even some YouTube videos out there on, on using that method for mite control. Looking at the new beekeepers we have here in town, we find that they will do that usually on their first or maybe their second season. And often it's not until the mid or the end of that second season that the mite populations explode. So they think they're being wonderfully effective and things are looking good. And if they're doing counts and seeing it, then yeah, they probably are. But if they do end up with an acute situation uh, at the middle or end of that second season, they may not be ready to deal with it as definitively as they need to be. Well, it is a little brutal for a new okay. beekeeper to, to kill off 300 bees. Yes, it is hard and it's harsh, um, which is another thing I cheat at is I go after my strongest colonies that have the highest brood population. If I have weaker colonies or smaller colonies that don't have as lot of brood, I don't do my alcohol washes on them. They're sitting right next to the other one, so I assume they're in the same condition. So I'll do a representative sampling of the yard. But again, when I treat, then I'm also gonna do a representative sampling of those same colonies so that my numbers make sense. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Um, the, other, the other thing I'd want to tie up, toss in real quick, uh, Catherine, is that one of the big points that we've made up here in Casper, and we're trying to share it around, be aware of your environment. Where I am at right now in my yard, I have at least six that I know of other bee yards within a quarter mile of me. That means that I am my neighbor's beekeeper. If I don't keep my mites under control, I don't keep my swarming under control, I am going to affect their livelihood and their enjoyment of their hobby. So it's, uh, and I know that <laughs> I have one beekeeper nearby here that is a, a very much a, a concerned about not killing the bees, about doing everything as natural as possible, doesn't want to use harsh chemicals. Uh, I suggested to them that they do an OAV treatment and they just about had a conniption fit right there in my face. <laughs> Uh, so I know I have a problem source. So I'm going to have a, an area that's going to be producing mites for me. So try not to be that person if you can help it. Be aware that you are your neighbor's beekeeper, not just your own colonies. Right. Beekeeping is animal husbandry. And there's a lot to it. It's just not a box full of bees that you've got in your backyard. Uh, another point that we have is a wonderful... Um, add on, uh, I really am a fan of the uh, registration, the state agricultural department's registration program. 
um, we have benefited from that here in Casper quite a bit, mostly in that our local weed and pest people watch that database and they have gotten so good. They've got GPS receivers on their spray trucks. They know where the colonies are, where the yards are, and they actively avoid spraying where the yards are and they keep track of it. They have logs and they can tell us, yeah, if your colony got pesticided out, it wasn't us. Yes. And we can see that happen. So is... Oh, hey, look, there's a whole chat window. I can look and see what people are saying. I just turned that on. Oh, man, am I not paying attention? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, oh, yeah, comments on the sprinkler. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of funny from a, a tech, tech geeky kind of a guy there. So is oxalic... Well, I have to admit, tonight... <laughs> Tonight, I wasn't thinking very, very techy. I wanted to make sure I had my ducks in a row. <laughs> I missed a few. That's okay. So from Steve, he wants to know, is oxalic acid vapor organic? It is considered organic by those that label such things and certify such processes, yes. Uh, the white reason we like to say that it's organic, and I wish I could put my hands on the research, when this first became a thing and a method for us to use, especially in the hobbyist arena, there was a paper that came out that they did a baseline measurement of the oxalic acid in a super. They had a number that occurs naturally in the hive, apparently. And so they did a baseline count on it, then they did their oxalic acid vaporization. Three days later, the oxalic acid level that was detectable and measurable in the hive had gone back to that same background level. Hmm. So it doesn't accumulate. Nice. That was, that's always been something that's been in the back of my mind is, is would I ever find it in my honey and do I have to worry about it accumulating in there? And That's a real contentious point. Uh, the way that the FDA has labeled it for use, you are to remove supers. And I kind of have to put myself out in a bit of a limb here that those of us that did oxalic acid vaporization before it was approved, we never took our supers off. <laughs> Well, so I have to say officially and legally follow the label, do what the rule says. Yeah. Yeah. Read the label. It's the law. <laughs> I, I get that a lot working for the, extension. Yeah, that's what they read say. The, the, yep. Yeah, read the label. It's the law. <laughs> yep. The label is the law. <sighs> Why? Pam says. Why what? Maybe there was more to come after that. I don't know. <laughs> Why does it affect honey? It's an introduced chemical into the colony. And uh, if it's sealed honey, no, it isn't going to pass through the seal. If it's open nectar or if it's honey that isn't cured yet, yeah, conceivably you could increase the oxalic acid level in the honey. Is it, effect, is it detrimental to those of us that want to eat it? Talk to your doctor about our oxalic acid intake. Personally, I don't think it is, but there are those that say it is. So don't take my advice as the only option, the only opinion. Does that work for you, Pam? Cool. Look at this. I can even answer questions direct. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's coming up I on need to have seven. Catherine read them to me. Appreciate you doing that, though. Thank you much for that. Yeah, well, sometimes it's... Uh like juggling a whole bunch of little balls and trying to read the chat and do a, do a talk at the same time. So I try to lighten your load a little bit. Much appreciated. Thank you much. Yes. So it's coming up on 7.30 here, everybody. And any last questions, thoughts, comments, we'll take them. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll let Tate get back to his evening. Yeah, I've got another face mask just came off the printer. So Time to start a new one. You have all the toys. When is the next one? Y'all, I'm, I'm working from home. So I'm sitting here at the house. If you guys want to get together anytime, let us know. We'll hang out and have a session. We've been doing this a lot in the IT arena to, uh, oh, the face shield. Yeah. We've been doing this a lot with the IT arena. We get together after work uh, to, uh, talk about the day and what we're all doing in isolation helps us stay sane. <laughs> so
So I'm going to try to have another beekeeping. So there you go. Yeah, just answer for Pam. This is a. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay. I'm going to try to have another beekeeping program the 28th. And I've been arm wrestling a couple people to do programs, and I'll send an email out and we'll be on Facebook and the normal channels to let everybody know who's my speaker and the topic. And we'll spend another Tuesday evening on beekeeping. And I think, I think if I remember correctly, I was kind of strong armed David Lewis into doing a first inspection on your beehive and what to look for. Oh, good, good, good one. Yeah. April 28th. Yep, Tuesday, April 28th. Okay. And for those that want to participate in any of our doings up here in Casper, uh, we started doing the meetings on Zoom as well. So we have regulars. We haven't had a presentation yet. But if you want to know about those, you can check us out on the Facebook group or email me. And uh, I'll get you added to our email reflector so you can see when we're doing that. Thank okay. you, Catherine. I really appreciate you setting this up and getting it going for us all. Yeah, Tate, thanks for, thanks for doing this. And thanks for being here and helping us all be better beekeepers. And that's what it's... That's what it's all about, right? Being a better beekeeper and good animal husbandry and, <laughs> yep. Well, the proof is in the pudding. If you end up with happy, healthy bees at the end of every season, then you're doing it right. So right. <laughs> whatever yeah. you're doing, keep at it. <laughs> there you go. All right, thanks everybody. And everybody yeah, have a good is. evening. Good night.